So hello everyone, thank you for joining today. I'm Tori Rudolph, Strategic Partnerships Manager at Fintech Australia, and we're thrilled to present today's webinar with OneSpan, How Australian Technology Secures Digital Agreements and Addresses the Challenges of Quantum Computing. We will be doing a Q&A today, so any questions throughout the webinar, please add them to the Q&A chat box below, and our panellists will get to these at the end of the session. So with that, I'm going to hand over to today's moderator, Michelle Levine, partner at Hamilton Lock, to introduce our panellists and get the session started. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much, Troy. Welcome, everyone. Excited to be moderating this event with the OneSpan team. Let me introduce you to Guy Harrison, the innovation architect of OneSpan and CTO and founder at Proven DB, and Will Lasala, the field chief technology officer at OneSpan. So... I've actually missing the questions, Guy, and the version that I've got here. So um, I'm just going to ask you, I'm just going to, I downloaded the wrong one, it appears, but I'm going to ask you the question. Please would you provide the background to Proving DB and how you ended up joining with OneSpan? Sure. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, great to be here, everyone. Um, yeah, Guy Harrison, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, so I'm, I'm a bit of local colour. Um, so let me start by just um, describing what ProvenDB is really quickly. Um, ProvenDB is essentially a sort of data storage solution that merges blockchain technology with database technology. So when something goes into a ProvenDB database, it's stored in a fairly traditional database system, but unlike other databases, everything's kept. So usually if you if you send an update to a database, it erases the old version and in place of the new, or you delete something, it's gone forever. But in ProvenDB, all the versions of data are kept forever. And digital signatures of that data are written to a public blockchain. And those signatures can prove hundreds of thousands of timestamps or integrity of the document. Um, hmm. Yeah. And any unauthorized tampering with the database will show up as it'll break those digital signatures. And these digital signatures also prove the timestamp for everything in there. So we, we set out um, to build a very trustworthy data storage solution. And this started back in um, 2018. We had VC funding to build a few other things and we, we pivoted to this blockchain storage solution. I'm a database guy going way back. And I've always been a little bit concerned by how the data in databases is essentially whatever the database administrator or the application says it is. Databases are just too mutable, it's too easy to change data in there. And this is sort of mirrors, I think, a problem that we all fairly aware with that digital tampering, falsification of information is just um, plaguing society as a whole. Not only do we have sort of famous cases where documents are tampered or um, data is maliciously changed, but we're also increasingly concerned by AI-generated fakes and just a general inability to believe what we see or, or what we read or, or what's presented to us. So ProvenDB was an attempt to create a database in which you could sort of believe, have a higher trust in it because you'd know for certain that no one had changed the data since it had been put in and you'd be able to see all the different changes that had occurred. Um, we went live um, 2020, right when um, March 2020, you might remember March 2020 was a big month for all of us. Um, so we went, we went live smack bang in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but we onboarded some um, early adopters and um, one just one example um, that I'm particularly sort of proud of is Reuters um, used proven DB technology and a proof of concept to validate uh, their um, photographic evidence. So what happens with Reuters is they take a photograph, it's signed by the specialised hardware in the camera, it goes up into their cloud, and every time any change is made to that camera, uh, that photograph, if it's cropped or colourised or enhanced in any way, um, the before and after image is stored to proven DB so that you can always go back through the sort of change chain of change to the um, photograph and all the way back to the camera. And yes, this particular photograph really was taken in the U in Ukraine on the date it says it was. It's signed by the camera itself and also by Proven DB. So all of those things are very exciting in the general sense. But at the beginning of this year, we were required by OneSpan, who you'll hear all about from Will in a moment. 
Um, and the mission at, or the, the desire at one span was to bring this sort of trustworthiness to the storage of digital agreements that is uh, sort of like a mainstay of one span's business. Thanks so much, Guy. Let me hand over to Will now. So you've been at OneSpan for quite some time. Can you tell us about the company, how you fit into the fintech space, and what led you towards the proven DB transaction? Yeah, absolutely. And first off, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to to be here. And Guy, if we want to move on into the next slide. Sorry, we went the wrong way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and, and yeah, just as you alluded, Michelle, I have been at OneSpan now for for uh, almost two decades or a little over two decades now, but actually OneSpan has been around for quite a bit longer. Um, so uh, we were, we've we been publicly traded. We're traded on the NASDAQ. Uh, we have over a thousand employees all over the world. Um, so uh, I get to I get to get out there and see a lot of the countries. I was actually just in Australia this year and uh, sitting with our local offices in Sydney, uh, kind of going around and seeing a number of our customers uh, that we have out there. But we have headquarters in Belgium and in Boston and in Montreal, Canada and Singapore uh, and Sydney and in Brazil. Um, there are offices all over the place. Um, beyond that, um, OneSpan kind of has its roots back in the security world. So when we first started out, really, it was all about finding how to authenticate a user, and how to prove their, you know, they, they are who they say they are and what they and doing the transaction that they wanted to do. Um, we also ha have our deep roots in electronic signature as well. So uh, providing those electronic documents and really a different form of transaction, but also protecting those documents. And right out of the gate, we started out in the financial district. So um, all of our customers really started to be the financial customers. So most of the most of them use us for retail banking, where they actually take our authenticators and our digital document security uh, and roll that out to their their customers. So when you actually go in to log into your bank account, you're probably using a one span solution uh, that gets in there, whether it's mobile hardware or just signing a mortgage or a loan or anything like that. Those are all different one span solutions out there. And from a scale perspective, you can imagine if you got all these retail customers out there that are using our solutions, there are hundreds of millions of authentications that happen and, and are in use around the globe. And there are billions of transactions that happen as we go through it. And Guy, go ahead and let's talk a little bit about our product solution itself. So I mentioned that you know OneSpan is very much so a security company. We look at everything from how how can we help our customers provide a secure use case and a secure workflow uh, as they're transacting with their with their with their customers, uh, and that really kind of starts out with looking at what a transaction is. And there's a bunch of different ways of that. And I'll get into that in the next slide. But in first and foremost, as we're looking at this workflow, every transaction to us should kind of fit into this nice uh, form around how you can secure it. So first thing we do oftentimes is we'll verify who you are, who you are. So we're looking at, you know, you've come to us, you're unknown, we've never met you before, the bank's never met you before. So how do we how do we decide to trust you when we get out of the gate? And this really comes into the form of identity verification, where we take some biometrics, we're scanning some selfie, we're looking at some information, we're comparing that to your license, we're checking to see if that license is fake or if there's any modifications on it. And then we're deciding the risk of it. Are you under duress or are you in your house or you're at the branch, all of those things. But we're really trying to verify you are who you say you are. Ultimately, once we've proven that we you are that person, we want to authenticate you. So the next time you come in, you don't have to go through that old process again. And so this is really where we, we add in our authentication solutions. Those authentication solutions can be hardware devices that generate codes. They can be mobile applications that sit inside a, a, a banking application and generate you know, passcodes behind the scenes, do biometrics, all of those things. But ultimately, these the once we've proven your identity, authenticated you, the bank wants to interact with this customer, right? So that's really what it's all about is interacting with those customers and creating those transactions. And ultimately you want to complete those transactions. We know that not every transaction is exactly the same. And so a lot of the times when you get into a transaction, when a customer gets into a transaction, they might get stuck or they might decide that they 
they need help from someone and that transaction might lead to a closed loss or they might not complete that transaction. And so OneSpan hopes to create a secure environment to allow our customers, our banks, to really interact with uh, those those customers that are having problems or that need a hand-holding solutions and to do it in a secure environment. And this is our interact pillar. So basically the ability to create a virtual session with a customer talking about secure information, uh, doing all the verification, all the authentication, the transaction data, and making certain that it all meets regulation and is all incorporated into that interact pillar. Finally, the, the transaction itself, you know, the piece that you're you're capturing the intent of the user. What did the user really want to sign? All of those things uh, go into our transaction pillar for our electronic signatures. And lastly, but certainly not least here, is when that document finally gets solidified, and really what Proven DB was all about here, is how do we prove that that was the original document? How do we come back and we make certain that that document hasn't been tripped? Uh, hasn't been changed? How do we make certain that it's what we thought it was going to be? Uh, and that all goes into our vault pillar. This sits on top of mobile security and what we call the OneSpan transaction cloud platform. So it's all cloud native. Go ahead and move to our next slide there, Guy, as we talk about the transactions themselves. So I mentioned there's lots of different transactions out there, right? Um, you, I'm certain as, you, as I walked you through kind of all of our products and how they look, you kind of saw, okay, well, maybe I just want to verify that identity of that user because the risk level of this particular transaction means that I, I don't really have that high level of value on that transaction. But maybe there are other transactions where you saw the whole workflow and you said, absolutely, there's a ton of risk on that transaction. We need to make certain it's super secure and there's a ton of value in incorporating it. Really, one span's solution kind of spans this whole gamut of transactions. And so we really look into this and kind of help our customers decide what types of security should be should they be implementing in all of these different transactions. You know, certainly uh, there's different pieces. So if you think about onboarding a, a brand new employee um, and you're like, okay, well, so why do I need to prove their identity? Well, I mean, in this day and age, people can fake all kinds of things. And so we're actually seeing People come in and say that they're some other person when they come in to, uh, to sign up for a job or finish out job paperwork. So sometimes you have to do things even, in, again, in that low value, low security uh, world uh, and, and where we are. And finally here, or as we kind of step into this, um, Guy, if you want to go ahead, go to the next slide here. Um, Everything that we do is really about regulation and meeting compliance in different regions. So being a very global company, it's super important that we meet different regulations that are very centric to a locality. Um, in Europe, this is in Europe and Asia, this is very sensitive and something that we concentrate a lot on. So we look at how our solutions can kind of help our customers meet those compliance uh, needs. And finally, in Australia itself, and go ahead, Guy, and uh, we look at, you know, how we how we are in the Australian market. I think we're doing, you know, quite a bit of business as we look at this. And, and as customers are, you know, you're working with your banks in Australia and New Zealand, there are a number of the banks that are using our solution um, across the area there. Um, additionally, when you're interacting with your government down there, there is also a bunch of uh, our solutions as well. So for taxes and for, for all of the other things that you might need to do transactions, uh, we are in there offering secure solutions to help protect those transactions. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Michelle. Thanks so much, Will. Guy, I just wanted to pop back to you and just find out how have you sort of applied the proven DB technology in OneSman and what do you see the future use cases for it? Great. Yep. Well, it hasn't been that long. We we came in in February, um, and it's um, it's November, so you know that's a bit over seven months. But we've achieved quite a lot, actually. Um, it's been very exciting. So the initial use of Proven DB inside of OneSpan has been to bolster the security and long term um, integrity of digital agreements. And by digital agreements, most of the time we're Sort of it's shorthand for sort of like something that's been e-signed, electronic signature. There's a bit more to it than that. 
Um, but you know, if you want to sort of, if you're if you're very unfamiliar with this, think you know, DocuSign when you're signing something with DocuSign or OneSpan, it's sort of the same thing. But as Will outlined, we already have a much stronger um, capability in the authentication realm. You know, we've got a lot of technology around authenticating, onboarding, and so giving us a sort of a very high um, credibility that the person signing the document is who um, who is supposed to be signing. And then we use the same industry standard trusted digital signatures that everybody uses to actually put the signature inside the PDF. The, the electronically signed document is signed using public key encryption, which is um, completely standard throughout the web. Uh, but I will come to some issues, vulnerabilities that it has that we're, we're closing by adding this additional layer of blockchain oriented security, adding a sort of a final signature that is um, uh, has no expiration. It can survive any sort of known um, cyber attack um, and is immune to any sort of future technologies, even including, and perhaps most importantly, um, including quantum computers. Now, um, I just want to sort of, for those who aren't sort of clear on what, what it means to sign an electronic document, just very, very quickly, the entire web is based on this thing called the public key infrastructure or the security and privacy on the web. So as we're talking today, we're talking through encrypted channels, um, and those encrypted channels are made possible by public and private keys. And so we have very, very highly trusted authorities that are issuing digital certificates that are saying that we are who we say we are. And those certificates are then used to encrypt communication um, in such a way that um, it could only have come from the um, authority or from the, um, the entity that was uh, issued with the certificate and that no one can eavesdrop on that communication. And we use this infrastructure every day, almost every minute we're on the web, um, we're taking advantage of this fantastic um, breakthrough um, triumph of software engineering and cryptography that's allowed the web to be relatively secure. However, it's not completely ideal when we're talking about signing documents that have to last for 10 or 15 years. So there are three main potential issues with a digital signature that's signed using the public key infrastructure. And going sort of on this diagram from um, right to left, first off, all the um, certificates that are issued by all of the authorities have expiration dates on them. And these expiration dates are meant to just take into account the possibility that someone might leak a key or that, you know, some other technology might come along. So they're only meant to be used for relatively constrained time periods. And if we're signing an NDA that's got sort of like a month of coverage, no problem at all. But if we're signing, say, a mortgage that's got a 20-year lifespan, then that is a bit of an issue because if all of the digital sig signatures that we used have expired, um, then we need some way of proving that this document was signed before they were expired. So that's one issue. A second issue is um, hacks and leaks. Now, all of the authorities go to enormous um, lengths to protect the private keys that are used to create these signatures. And I mean, really enormous lengths, you know, never letting them come onto the internet, doing all sorts of procedures. Um, nevertheless, over a 20 year time period, the chance that none of them will ever get leaked is maybe not good enough. And with the certificate authorities themselves, we're talking about the big people like Entrust and DigiCert and so forth, their certificates might be protecting millions of documents. And so if any of these certificates were ever breached, we'd sort of invalidate millions of documents in one hit, tens or even hundreds of millions of documents. So that's a concern. And then finally, and most inevitably, quantum computing is coming. And quantum computers will be able to take a public key and spit out the private key. And when that happens, all of today's cryptography is going to be um, invalidated. Now, we'll have new cryptography put in place over the next few years, no doubt about it. Lots of companies, including OneSpan, are, are working towards that. Um, but if you're signing a document today, you need to be wondering whether this signature that you're placing on here will be cracked by a quantum computer in the future, or perhaps that all of the signatures signed by a particular root authority will be cracked. So there are the three issues that we're sort of like seeking to address here. 
And to sort of drill in a little bit, I hope this isn't too much detail for people, but to do a little animation that I've put together. So here we have a digital agreement and it's got some expiry span. Think of mortgage of, you know, a $2 million mortgage with a 20 year lifespan. So it's worth real money and it's got a very long um, period of effectiveness. And these three certificates represent the um, root authority certificate, um, the issuing certificate and the signing certificate that are used in almost all digital agreements. And they all have expiration dates that, um, sorry, I went a bit ahead of myself then. Um, and they all have expiration dates. And unless you're very, very lucky, they'll all expire before the end of the um, validity of the, of the mortgage or what have you. Um, so we're worried during that 20 year period that a hacker might come along and manage to um, subvert one of those certificates. And we're worried that a quantum computer will come along over that 20 year period and be able to break the, um, the certificates encryption mechanisms. So they're the threats. How we're using proven DB and blockchain technology to alleviate that threat is conceptually reasonably simple. We sign it in the normal way, but we add a blockchain transaction um, when we're storing it into the trust vault. And that blockchain transaction represents a kind of like a, it's a hash, it's like um, a signature certifying the validity of that, um, the, the contents of that particular document. But unlike uh, this, the digital signatures that are sort of proving who signed it, these particular hashes are not quantum vulnerable and they never expire. So this um, single blockchain transaction will prove for the lifespan of the document exactly when it was signed and exactly what was signed. And by doing that, we can prove, for instance, that the signature occurred before the advent of a quantum computer. And we don't have to re-sign the signature ever because we've signed it once with this quantum safe signature. Um, pardon me, I've just got a frog in my throat here. So that's what we're doing today, um, and that's being released now. The Australian rollout is happening as we speak. Um, going forward, so you might remember Will's um, five pillars of one-span technology. Clearly, we're using this in this vault technology. So the blockchain proven DB technology is preserving and protecting all of the artifacts that we're storing for long-term um, integrity in the vault. But we will um, be extending this kind of blockchain technology pretty much across the entire suite as we look at sort of how audit trails are maintained, um, how um, authentication records can be proved in the future, how we can really prove that someone, you know, that we authenticated correctly. Everything to do with compliance um, and regulation will be um, uh, increasingly placing in the proven DB storage. So I know that was a bit long winded. I hope that wasn't too detailed for people, but. Um, you know, I am a tech guy, so <laughs> I only really speak tech with some experience. Thanks so much, Guy. Um, well, I just wanted to ask you, how real is the threat of quantum computing to digital security? And how should our members view that threat? Yeah, those are great questions, great questions. Guy, can you, thank you so much. So, so yeah, the first question that I hear from everybody is, how real is this? And, you know, I think we, we kind of, link this back to like you know we're just talking about star trek right is this, this is way out in the future that is no longer the case so 40 years ago is really where we started looking at this with richard freeman and what he was doing with uh, the theory of quantum computers and how that all came together uh and if you asked the scientists back then every 10 years they'd say or every year they say that they were going to have something in 10 years so that rolled forward for a number of years and every year they'd be like, yeah, it's 10 years out. That's no longer the case. So about six years ago, we started seeing tangible technologies coming out of quantum uh, physics and quantum computers. Now this isn't something where you're gonna go and pick up a personal computer uh, and you're gonna carry this around. It's just, that's, that's not where we are yet. Um, you're more than likely looking at quantum computers, uh, first off, they have to be kept super cold, which means that more than likely they're going to be in a data center somewhere. Uh, and those data centers are going to be set, kept super cold and they're big machines that are that are doing this. And um, But they've made a lot of advances in this. And actually, quantum computers are things that you can touch today. So there's uh, companies like IBM out there that actually have websites that you can go on and 
create quantum computing jobs where you can interact with a real quantum computer today uh, and you can ask it different you know, questions and, and, and work on different mathematical problems and what have you. And just a few years ago, uh, Google announced quantum supremacy. Uh, and so what that actually meant was they proved that uh, a quantum computer can do something better than a traditional computer. Now, it doesn't mean that the quantum computer is, uh, was able to do everything better, but they found one specific thing that made that computer much better than what our traditional computers could do. So that really put the nail in that, hey, quantum computers are here, we're ready for this, and we have to start embracing this. So yes, quantum computers are really here, and we really have to start taking them seriously, and what those mean for our cybersecurity environments. Guy, could you go ahead to the next slide here? So really, what is this? What does this mean for, for cybersecurity? Right, uh, I've got these these big data centers with these really powerful computers, um, and guy was just telling us how you know they can break all kinds of things out there, uh, break all this encryption, and all my documents are going to leak, uh, and uh, and I have to be really worried about that. And the reality of the situation is, yes, you should be thinking about this. We commonly refer to this as Q Day, um, because basically at some point in the not too distant future. Um, there's going to be a situation where the quantum computer will overtake what our traditional computers can do. When they do that, um, they'll have, they're trying to break some of these strong mathematical problems that you see on here. So you'll hear things like, uh, like you know, the Schur's algorithm and how we can test for these, uh, different, these different problems and come back to them. But reality is that we're, we're trying to solve the problem of the infrastructure and how the data is being encrypted. So, you know, the reality of the situation when you're looking at what's happening today, there are nations out there that are recording all of our data. And the reason that they're recording all of our data is so that at some point in the future, when QDay happens, they can take that data and they can pass it through this quantum computer and they can do things like read your email, uh, de decipher your VPN traffic, see all of that data that's going on. So this whole thing about quantum computers and how we can, you know, how strong our encryption is, is something that we really have to take into consideration. Now, it is very important to point out that quantum computers do have, that there are algorithms out there that, can, that are unbeatable by or unbreakable by quantum computers today. So there are things that we can do, algorithms that people should already be switching to. And that's really the whole point of this, is that you should be thinking about this and really starting to put into practice uh, the movement to unbreakable encryption algorithms and unbreakable quantum computer proof solutions. So it's not, you know, I don't want you to sit back here and be like, oh, the sky is falling, but you really should be starting to take those first steps into making that you know, to making your move into these unbreakable uh, quantum algorithms. And go ahead, Guy, and flop over to the next slide here. So when is Q-Day? When is the sky going to fall? When is everything going to break down on us? Uh, what are we worried about? Um, is it tomorrow? Well, uh, I don't think we can say specifically when that, uh, when that day is gonna come out. I think most industry experts, such as Michael Jackson, uh, Mark Jackson on here, Michael, Mark Jackson on here, uh, who's a famous <laughs> scientist, uh, very intelligent man, and he's gonna get a kick out of that that I called him Michael. But uh, he, uh, you know, he kind of pegs this at about 2026. Um, and, you know, he, we're gonna see these really big changes um, and what's coming uh, happen very quickly. So, you know, as we look at what where quantum computing is happening, um, NIST has already started to take this seriously, right? So NIST, the U.S. National Standards and, uh, Institute, uh, has, this, has come out in 2022 with a list of uh, algorithms that they believe will be, you know, that are quantum proof. And so they want to put these out there for our, for our corporations so we can start adopting them and start changing to them. Now, what they've done is they've actually rolled out three algorithms so far, and they've opened up this whole thing about allowing people to test and see if they can crack these algorithms and, and opening up a you know request for comment in it. They're planning on rolling out the fourth algorithm next year. Now, while they were doing that, they're actually testing all of these different theories and 
what they found was that some of their theories um, there weren't as sound as others. So they've even made up backup algorithms. So that's how serious that you know these people are taking this. So it's something that you should also be looking at. Uh, and if you still are questioning, you know, well, what is should I really be interested in this, and what should I be putting my stake in the sand as to when I should be really worried about this? The Cloud Security Alliance here, which is a great big uh, alliance that has uh, a lot of clout around what happens in the cloud and how secure uh, your solutions are, they've come out with kind of this press release talking about Q Day being April fourteenth, uh, two thousand and. Uh, let me see here. Sorry, I have this note. 2030. So April 14, 2030 is what they have set their their mark in the sand for when they believe that any security algorithm that is not quantum proof will be able to be bro broken by. So we only have a, about seven years left, according to them. Uh, well, less than that now. Uh, and uh, and we have to be on to the next solution. And with that guy, back over to you. Or Michelle, back over to you. That's okay. <laughs> Um, guys, so one span's proposing that blockchain is actually a really good solution in order to defend against quantum computing and the and the breaking of these kinds of cryptology. Can you explain how blockchain actually does address those threats and how relevant it is to the fintech industry? Oh, um, yeah. So just just to sort of follow up a bit on what um, uh, what Will was just saying and, and what you just said, I, I, we don't, we're not saying that blockchain is the one and only and, and total answer to it, right? There's there's a bunch of different threats that are occurring um, and opportunities in quantum computing. Um, blockchain happens to be a good fit for sort of like data integrity, um, proving data integrity, um, but it's it's not going to it's not going to solve the problem of real time communication using HTTPS or anything like that. It's not sort of like the the, the holy grail. There's a bunch of new algorithms and we'll be moving to them over, over time. Um, but um, to talk about blockchain, obviously I'm a true believer in blockchain. Um, I've been in the space now for uh, six, seven years. And as I said, I came from a very strong data storage background, database administration, database optimization, that sort of thing. Um, and um, I've sort of like get fairly philosophical about things. So um, I'd sort of like see this as a progression in in our sort of ability as humans to store information. So if we go way, way back um, to the first type of financial records, um, this is a cuneiform tablet. Um, I think it's about uh, five or 7,000 years old. It's, um, it's essentially a financial record. It's agricultural records, which is pretty close to the same thing back in an agrarian society. You know, there's no... You know, there's no factories producing stuff. What what people are trading and exchanging for is is essentially food. Um, and so, you know, our civilization is based on on this. You know, largely on our ability to store data. If you think about it, the reason why one generation progresses from the next and we get better and better over time is largely because we can write things down and rely on 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 the information that one generation stores and passes on to the next. So obviously we've used other um, media like stone tablets that are, are great as well, but really it was paper that sort of became the um, go-to technology for us to store information on. It's cheap, it's portable, um, and, um, it, you know, it, it became the basis for sort of like all financial records for, um, you know, many, hundred, many, many hundreds of years. Um, then... Um, before most of us were born, but not that far before, um, we started using digital technologies. This is the first digital hard drive. Um, it's five megabytes. Um, this is, I think, photograph taken in 1956. I have to tell my staff that that's not me um, because they think I'm old and then I am. Um, it's amazing to think back on those times, right? This is the same five megabyte disk drive being loaded onto a truck. Four guys had to move five megabytes and today of course five megabyte packets are sort of like flying through your head all the time you know like we're surrounded by a sort of like electromagnetic sort of um, flux of data just flying everywhere it's amazing what progress has been made in what is you know less than 100 years a, a complete transformation of how we store information and hard drives obviously or disk drives solid state drives whatever digital storage technologies have gotten uh, faster, denser, cheaper, 
um, improved in every way. And now they are the basis for, I'd argue, pretty much all of our, this generation's records. The, the, the records we're going to pass on to the next generation are increasingly largely stored digitally. And um, obviously that includes all the financial records of pretty much every organisation, every record almost, right? There is still some stuff on paper. Um, Michelle, as a lawyer, I'm sure you've still got tonnes of paper. But generally, you know, we're looking more and more to have stuff digitally. Now, the disk drive, great breakthrough. One of its design goals was to allow it to be overwritten. So we wanted to have a storage medium where we could write something and then delete it and then use it again. And without that capability of being able to reuse it, it wouldn't have got where it has. But that very feature that we spent so much sort of energy on achieving is its vulnerability as well, because we can't tell when anything's overwritten. Um, we can't, if you replace something on a hard drive, uh, there's no sort of like internal forensic that can tell you that it's happening or that it's happened. So when you think about, um, you guys may or may not be familiar with the ARPA data risk guidelines that sort of like say um, uh, how financial records should be maintained. They talk about forensic tracing, non-repudiation, um, transparency of alterations, a, a bunch of things that are just totally the opposite of what a disk drive is designed to do. It's designed not to leave any forensics, not to sort of like show transparency of alterations. It's like the opposite of of what we need. So this has been an increasing concern in many places. And as I said, more towards the beginning of the presentation, we live in an age of false information and low trust, which is sort of undermining lots of things, not just financial records, but it includes financial records. And in the um, Banking Royal Commission, um, many cases of um, financial malfeasance involving rewriting of records and backdating of information were highlighted. So that's the problem, and it's largely a problem we've created by the technology that we're now using. So blockchain comes along as a sort of an interesting um, solution to that. Blockchain was designed as a system to record cryptocurrency transactions, essentially, and as such, the design was the opposite of the disk drive. Instead of like, let's overwrite something, leaving no trace, it was let's never be able to overwrite anything. Let's just keep this ledger growing um, immutably and provide some sort of mechanism whereby people can't overwrite it. And although the blockchain is living on disks, its internal mechanisms do prevent um, overwriting by any sort of practical means. Now, again, apologies if I'm getting too far into the weeds here. But how the blockchain works, essentially each block in the blockchain has a pointer to the previous block. Um, and that pointer amalgamates all the transactions in the previous block um, and is stored in the next block. Um, and these go all the way down, all the way to the very first block in the blockchain. Um, now, in order to change anything historically, you have to therefore change every block that's come after that. And the mechanisms for changing blocks depends on your blockchain. Bitcoin's different from Ethereum, it's different from Hedera. But the mechanisms from changing blocks make that um, practically impossible. I mean, never say never, but for instance, to overwrite something on the Bitcoin blockchain, you'd have to amass more CPU than the current network has in total. And you'd have to maintain that CPU power um, for the amount of time going back to the record that you want to overwrite. So let's say you want to overwrite a record on Bitcoin blockchain from last year. You'd have to get a network bigger than the current Bitcoin blockchain and you'd have to run it for more than a year. And even when you did that, the existing network would just um, essentially reject it. What are you doing? This we, we don't take you know, complete replacements of one year's worth of blockchain. So it would become a sort of a denial of service attack and it'd be quite disruptive, but it wouldn't succeed. So for all intents and purposes, we have this sort of ledger that can't be overwritten. And so from a um, from a sort of like a financial records point of view, it's a perfect audit trail for all of these things that the ARPA um, data risk guidelines are asking us to do. And as an added bonus, not necessarily by design, but as it happens, the digital signatures that attach one block to, to the other are SHA-2 signatures. These are not quantum vulnerable. As Will said, quantum um, algorithms can break some sorts of encryptions, but not others, and the SHA-2s aren't. So the blockchain historical records remain kind of um, uh, resistant to any sort of 
uh, quantum computing attack. Now, um, you can't store everything on a blockchain. And that's, you know, circling back to the very beginning of the presentation. That's why we built ProvenDB, because we wanted to have a system that had that characteristic of the blockchain of being able to have immutable records and, you know, being very, very sure that what has been written hasn't been overwritten. But combine that with the speed, efficiency, convenience, um, storage capacity, um, transaction rates of a modern database. Uh, so that's, um, I think, those of us who have been sort of mucking around in blockchain since, you know, 2015, 2016, probably will remember that, it, you know, in 2016, we thought everything was going to change over the blockchain within a couple of years. And that hasn't happened. And so we're in a bit of a, a trough of disappointment with blockchain. But I would still I would still argue that it's a very important technology for data integrity. And we're in a world in which data integrity is just so important. Back to you, Thanks Michelle. So. Thanks so much, Guy. Well, I, it would be great if people had any questions popping it into the Q and A box. But while we're waiting for that, I might ask some myself if you don't if you don't if you don't mind. Um, so, I understand that your solutions on the Hedera on the Hedera blockchain, um, and that some of the information will be publicly available. Can people reverse engineer it and work out what happened? based on that or do you need to have the separate piece of information somewhere else in order to be able to put two and two together? Uh, yes, it's the latter. So what goes on the blockchain is, um, as I, I called it a digital signature, it's a hash essentially, I think maybe a checksum. Um, so you can, if you've, if you've got this checksum and you've got the document that's been signed, you can prove that this document was signed on or about the date of the blockchain signature. But from the blockchain signature itself, you can't create the document. I mean, it's it's the hash is 256 bits. It's, you know, the document is, you know, one megabyte. There's no way to go backwards from one to the other. It's, and even if they were different sizes, it's a completely one-way algorithm um, that doesn't allow for any sort of reverse engineering. Well, that's really, that's really good. And sorry, sorry, Will, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think most of the time people are worried about the PII, right? You know, so if I if I use blockchain and I put data on the blockchain, does my information go everywhere? Uh, and every time that you see the block, and I, I think it's really important to point out here, just as kind of guy was uh, giving you the technical description, uh, but really we're not putting your PII, we're not putting the data from that transaction on the blockchain. We're using the blockchain to really prove the integrity of that document. Right, so not the, the the data inside of it, but really when did when did it happen? You know, uh, at what stage was it? All of this information, you know, who signed it? When did it happen? What's that? What's that signature look like? Uh, and that's really what we're using to put the the, the blockchain for, uh, and really protects that whole thing, and and ultimately leads to you know not having to worry about that PII problem. Would a good way of describing it be it's sort of like an authentication overlay, but it actually doesn't actually give you the the originating piece? Sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I'm trying to think of a a um, a, a sort of non a sort of an analog equivalent to, um, but a, a checksum is the thing that I keep coming back to in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's it's proof. Um, but it's it's just a proof if you've got the document. It doesn't it doesn't contain the document. Um, I think that's really important. And you obviously are storing information. How do you go about storing that information? Obviously, you're working with banks and government. They're always very concerned about data security and data location. How have you approached that with your solution? Guy, uh, sure, I, I can answer. Or, or well, I mean, we're both. Um, yeah, but uh, essentially. Um, um, one span does work with banks. Um, we're SOC two compliant. Um, Will can probably rattle off more certifications, you know, given his yeah. longer history with one span. Um, we're a tr totally trusted vendor. We apply to all all best practices in ev at every level, doing everything. Um, for this particular um, endeavour, the uh, data is stored, encrypted um, at at um, at rest, um, encrypted in transit. Um, it uh, we have five locations around the world where data resides. So if you're concerned about data not leaving your local jurisdiction, um, 
we have that covered. And one of these locations will be in Australia. It's um, just about to go live, I think, within the next week or so. Um, but, um, you know, there's two uh, US locations and a Europe location and, and Canada. Um, yeah. I think that's right. Um, yeah. And, and as but we it's look everything at this, you'd expect. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So as we look at this, it, 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 data residency is really important to our customers. So. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, a guy kind of mentioned that there's all different regulations that are out there on it. But uh, what we do with our customers uh, is, first off, we work with them to make certain that we we meet whatever the regulation is that they need. So uh, if it can't leave, let's say that you know we're dealing with the UK and I uh, regulation where the data has to be in in you know in Great Britain or what have you. Uh, we would look at that with uh, you know putting the data center uh, and leveraging our data center technology there. So we leverage AWS for our infrastructure, allowing us to kind of pull everything together and to spin up very quick infrastructures where, wherever necessary. So that really helps us in, in kind of meeting those demands for where the data residency has to be. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. really great. It's interesting, actually, coming from a startup, you, you know, one of the big problems is that you just don't have that sort of credibility. If you're going to offer these sorts of solutions um, at some point, you know, to banks, they're just not going to take a, a startup from a, a bunch of guys in Melbourne who are, you know, smart for sure, you know, or well, hopefully we're smart. <laughs> but, you know, no matter how smart you are, I guess is what I'm saying, is you you end up needing to be inside an organisation that can provide the level of trust and has the resources to do all this and, um, checking that, that a company of one span size, size can do. So I... I'm still waiting for some questions, so I'll keep I'll keep asking if you if you don't mind and if you don't in, in, indulge me. Um, ESG environmentally carbon footprint always synonymous with discussions around blockchain technology and how heavy it is on the energy consumption piece. Thoughts on how that might work in your space and um, and how green your solution is? Sure. Yep, I can answer that one. Um, so it is it it is an interesting topic. Um, it's it, it, it arose really because Bitcoin was and still is um, incredibly carbon intensive. So if you remember back to that diagram I had of blocks, the reason why it's so hard to add a new block in, in Bitcoin is you have to do this incredibly complicated calculation. Um, it's like a race between all the nodes on the network to get the first person to get the right answer to this, to this CPU intensive calculation. It's actually not that complicated, but it's CPU intensive, um, gets to gets to put the block on and gets rewarded in Bitcoin. And meanwhile, um, all that CPU is being sort of like burned. Um, all the other nodes that didn't win the block, they wasted that CPU. And then you get the situation where Bitcoin's, I forget the exact amount, but um, at times has been um, is consuming as much electricity as a small European country and, um, you know, maybe even a mid-sized one. Um, so that's the concern. Um, Ethereum was using the same algorithm, but last year they switched to proof of stake, um, which is, I won't go into the details, but it's a different algorithm for doing the same thing. Um, their uh, carbon footprint dropped overnight by, um, well, it dropped by sort of 99.999%. Um, so they suddenly became, you know, not at all carbon intensive. Uh, and the, the blockchain we prefer and the one that we are currently using is Hedera. And they have always been very, um, they're the most green of all the blockchains. They use the least electricity to, to perform their um, optimizations and um, block validations. Um, in addition, they buy um, carbon, credit, carbon credits um, such that the more transactions you do, on Hedera, this still sounds ridiculous, but that's how carbon credits work. The more transactions you do, the less carbon is released into the atmosphere because they're buying up credits that would otherwise be bought up by someone who would release carbon into the atmosphere. So they're actually carbon uh, negative. Um, uh, they're still consuming electricity, though. So, I've, you know, sometimes I wonder whether it's a bit of an accounting trick. But nevertheless, they're extremely they're low. They're offsetting, yeah. They're offsetting. Uh, it's, it's valid, yeah. It's, it's valid. I mean, you can't still say that you, you're running data centres and there's no carbon being produced by those data centres. But um, but even if you took the offsets away, their footprint is even lower than Ethereum's after this, this change and is now really quite negligible. That's really good to hear. Um, just want to double-check no one has any more questions for 
will or guy. Seems you've done such a comprehensive job. And so straightforward. There's no question. <laughs> Everyone's either completely informed or completely confused. So hopefully <laughs> it's the first, not the latter. But um Tori, should we should we should we wrap up with that? Yeah, if there's no questions, happy to wrap up here. Well, I just want to thank Will and Guy again for sharing all their insights and knowledge and particularly about their solution to what seems to be quite a close problem that people might not be appreciating to date. Hopefully it's not like the Y2K bug and actually doesn't happen, but this sounds very real and very close. Um, so thank you for your time. Sorry, I missed the first question because um, I managed my, my phone was too smart. It managed to put it into Outlook, um, which did the presentation mode as opposed to the PDF guy. I worked out. <laughs> worked okay, out the problem. No problem. We, we got there. We got there. Yeah. So thank you so much. And thank you, Tori, for having us, um, both Guy and myself, um, for the session. Will, Guy, did you want to close out with any with any words? You know, I'll, I'll maybe take a few seconds here. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, for attending. You know, I, I know this all seems, you know, out there. Hopefully we've brought this down to earth a little bit more, uh, something something more you can touch and feel and, and what have you. It is a super technical um, problem to overcome and to understand. And, you know, we, we have a number of uh, sessions that are still coming. So please be on the lookout for those. And if you have any questions, please always uh, feel free to reach out to OneSpan. We're, we're happy to help. Guy, did you have anything further you wanted to say? I'll just, I'll just echo that. Uh, look, um, I'll just say from the Australian perspective, as an Australian startup, you know, it's been great to be um, become part of a, a bigger team. Um, we're hoping to do, you know, more business here in Australia as well as around the world. So, um, yeah, um, feel free to reach out. I'm in the same time zone, so I'm ready to discuss. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Over to you, Tori. Yeah, it's been a fantastic session. So thank you, Will, Michelle and Guy for all of those valuable insights. I think, um, yeah, with no questions, it's been such a diligent session. So thank you for sharing those insights and thank you everyone for joining. Thanks so much. See you later. Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.